on Facebook. And we're recording so that this can be on YouTube as well. So hello, Kristen, and hello, Christina. Hello. Hello. How are you? Hello again. Hello again. Christina, I've seen you so many. It's so it's so wonderful. Oh, so great. But yet we still need to do your book. So we still <laughs> we'll talk about that. Because we we're hoping for 2022 is what is what I'm hearing. So, <laughs> so lots of, lots of people will be super excited about that. Um, so Kristen, you're joining. Are you, so did you so you, you are actually on a real physical book I tour. I am on a physical book tour. Yeah. I have now done physical events in three states. Florida, and so Florida, where are you? Today, where are you coming? Where are you coming to us from? I am in Spartanburg. I'm in the Marriott in Spartanburg, South Carolina. <laughs> there you go. All right. And Christina, you're just up the coast in Oregon, right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Just outside of Portland. Yeah. Okay. So we've got the coasts covered and hopefully we've got people joining us in between the coasts too tonight. So just real quick, I'm going to get some housekeeping things and then we'll get right to the conversation. So Kristen, so we can get through the conversation and you can go relax. <laughs> So we'll be like Kristen, we'll be like tapping on the Kristen, wake <laughs> exactly. up. Exactly. Wake, 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 wake. Yeah. wake up, wake up. Um, just real quick, just for those that don't know, but I think we have a lot of repeat customers that come in. And Kristen, we had you last year as well. But for those that are joining us that might not know, Warwick's is located in San Diego, in La Jolla, California. And we are, we got a great year coming up. This is our, this year of 2021, my little sign that says 1896, we're celebrating our 125th anniversary this year. Amazing. Right? So Amazing. fun. And so it's, um, so we've got lots of great things. If you're not on our email list, go to our website, we see all the wonderful events and authors that we're hosting like Kristen and Christina um, and join our email list because coming in the fall, we're going to have some fun like trivia contests to win some gift certificates and some fun things. But um, yeah, it's going to be, it's 125 years, all the things that talk about historical fiction, the things that a bookstore has seen in 125 years. It's like, oh yeah. my. Um, so for everybody who's watching tonight on Facebook in the comment section, I'm going to be putting uh, the forest of, who's got a copy of the book? Do you have a copy of the, Christina? You, you would go. think I would have a copy of my own book, but I'm on tour. Oh, uh, you're on tour. I so don't bring have... any, well, no, I have like 50 copies in my car, but I don't have any in my hotel room with me. How ridiculous is that? I love that. But there we go. So Christina's got us covered. So there's the forest of vanishing stars. Um, so I'll be putting that into the chat so that you can easily order that. I always like to say any way that there is to get a book, you can get it from Warwick's. We ship. We'd love you to come by the store and see us and pick up other books like Christina's too. Um, so there's always that. We also, I'm gonna share my screen here for a second because we have, let me get to the right part here. I want to show people this fun thing that we are giving away today. Um, we are giving away this beautiful tote yeah. and some fun cozies. And what's that down at the bottom? It looks like a key. Is that a bottle opener by any chance? Yeah, it's a little bottle opener uh, keychain that says, oh. Be the Light, the Forest of Vanishing Stars. <laughs> I love that. So we're going to be giving away this wonderful little prize here. And I will talk more about that um, towards the end too. But how you get a chance to win this wonderful prize is by asking a question. So in the comment section of Facebook, go ahead and put a question in there. I'll be feeding those into um, Christina. And you, even if your question doesn't get asked, you are still entered into the prize winning potential. So um, we will have Kristen, I'm going to assign numbers to your names when you do that. I'm going to have Kristen pick a number at the end and um, we'll have a winner that we'll have with that. If, if so if, still, if, if I'm still conscious at the end. If you're still conscious, if, Christina if will have, Christ numbers are. Yeah. Christina will have your back. I'll make Christina. If you're passed out on the bed behind you there, we'll have Christina. Do. <laughs> so close. Can I would now, like, so I now like to read you the entire book. <laughs> I love it. So great. Okay. So very quickly. Do your bios and then I can get, you guys can get to your, to get to the great conversation here. So Kristen Harmel is the New York Times bestselling author of a dozen novels, including The Book of Lost Names, The Winemaker's Wife, The Room on Room, Emily, 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 uh, Emily, Emily, and The Sweetness of Forgetting. She is also the co-founder and co-host of the popular web series, Friends in Fiction. She lives in Orlando, Florida, but is joining us from South Carolina tonight. <laughs> and she's here to talk to us tonight, but Christina showed us The Forest of Vanishing Stars. And with her is Christina McMorris. 
Christina is a New York Times and USA bestselling, today bestselling author of two novellas and five historical novels, including the runaway bestseller sold on a Monday. Initially inspired by her grandparents' World War II courtship letters, her works of fiction have garnered more than 20 national literary awards. Prior to her writing career, she hosted weekly TV shows from Warner Brothers and an ABC affiliate beginning at age nine, I love that, with an <laughs> Emmy award-winning program and owed a wedding and event planning company until she had far surpassed her limit of YMCA and chicken dances. I hear you there, girl. <laughs> and hoka, hoka, man, oh, no ho hoka. Oh. Yeah, oh dear God. She lives in Oregon with her husband and her two sons, ages 15 and 17, going on 40. You have, a, you have your hands full, my friend. Yes. <laughs> have a great conversation. We'll see you in a little so bit. Much. Thank you so much. Thank so you. good to be back here. And it's so good to see oh you, Kristen. Good to see you too, Christina. Thank you so much for doing this with me. And thank oh. you so much to Warwick's for hosting us. This is wonderful. So, so fun. So, okay. We have so much to talk about with this book. And you and I have like done lots of texting over like months and months, but haven't talked in quite some time. So, okay. So first of all, for the people here who are not familiar yet, do you want to share a little bit about what the story is about? Sure. So the Forest of Vanishing Stars is the story of a young woman named Yona who was kidnapped from her German parents when she was just a little girl. It's her second birthday. And there's this woman named Yerusha who feels like she's been called by the forest itself to come and take this little girl, to come and take her and give her a completely different life, a completely different destiny. So she takes her from her parents in Berlin, in their Berlin apartment. She moves her into the woods and they move east and east until they are in Eastern Poland, what is now Belarus. The area of the book is now in Belarus. Um, so uh, she teaches her everything she needs to survive in the woods. She was raising her deep in the heart of the woods. She teaches her all these survival skills, how to um, tell the good herbs from the bad ones, how to dress wounds, how to kill a man with her bare hands, how to ice fish in the winter, how to build a shelter in every kind of conditions, all the things she needs to live deep in the heart of the woods with virtually no human interaction skills because she has virtually no human contact. So when the old woman dies in 1942, leaving Yona alone, she's in her early 20s, and she's wandering the forest alone. She's been told many times for her whole life, you have to stay hidden. You have to stay in the woods. You can't venture out outside of the woods. Um, but her life intersects with that of a family of fleeing Jewish refugees. And everything changes. She finds out for the first time what's happening outside the safety of her woods. So she knew there was a war going on. She could hear the bombs dropping. She could hear the gunfire. Um, but she had no idea that the Germans were rounding up Jewish citizens putting them in ghettos, deporting them, murdering them. And now the forests are filling with people fleeing to save their lives. And so she has this decision to make. Does she do what she can to help? Um, or does she retreat back into the safety of her forest? And obviously she does what she can to help, or it would be a very, very, very short book, which in retrospect would have been easier to write. It would have been like 40 pages and we could have just, you know, all gotten on with things. But, um, but, but I've provided you a 350 page book instead. So um, Yona does decide to help. Um, and um, in doing so, she kind of unlocks this story that, um, that becomes about identity and about the questions of who she really is. She was born to these German parents. We know from chapter one that her father was an enthusiastic follower of Hitler. Um, so how, how responsible is she, is, is she for that? Because that's what's in her blood. That's what she was born into. Um, but then she's raised by this Jewish mystic in the woods. So how much of that is a piece of her? And then she allies herself with these Jewish refugees. So how much of that is a piece of her? So it's a story about identity. What makes us who we are? Um, and how much power do we have to change our fate and change our destiny? Um, it's also a story of coming of age because for the first time in her early 20s, she's learning to interact with other people and she's learning all the nuances of human interaction. It's also a story based very, very firmly on um, the real life stories of Jewish refugees who fled into the forests of Eastern Europe during World War II and survived the war that way. So the real stories are so incredible that you can hardly believe them. I mean, they're almost unbelievable. But thousands of people, thousands of Jews who are being persecuted, who are being hunted, fled into the woods of Eastern Europe and managed to live, lived in the woods for two to two and a half years and walked out of the 
uh, walked out of the forest at the end of the war alive, which is incredible. So that is at the heart of this story, the, the deep research um, into that, um, that component of it. So that's kind of the forest of vanishing stars in a nutshell, um, part coming of age, part search for identity, um, part, um, part forest as a character, because I think the forest really um, comes into play and part honoring of the real life story of these incredible, incredible refugees. It's amazing, which you do in every book, of course, like honoring somebody from the past. Thank that, you. Well, that, as do you, thank you. You may not know about, which is just, which, you know, I love about the book of uh, Lost Names, of course, thank and now Vanishing Stars is so beautiful. And yeah. so people, by the way, since you, can you see that little reflection, you must see this, were you just beside yourself when this came in with your, it's Gosh. so beautiful. It's gorgeous. And I, you know, I had obviously seen it in the advanced review copies. I had seen it on my computer screen, but um, the, the finished book itself is just so beautiful with, like you said, that, that shimmery kind of gold lettering and just the detail. Oh, they, I, I, honestly, my publisher just knocked it out of the park with this cover. I'm so grateful. Oh, it's so stunning. It's so stunning. So since I know a lot of readers like to hear about covers because they're the, the, the yeah. such part of what we do. Um, so can, you want to talk about that a little bit? Was this the first one that they showed you? Did you have any input on this? Okay. So I have to tell you, that's a great question. I have to, and I have a couple things I can tell you about the cover. So um, to answer your question, it is essentially the first one they showed me with some tweaks. And I will tell you the cover designer who does these, who does my cover, she's done, I think my last five covers. Her name is Chelsea McGuckin. She is a flipping genius. I mean, everything she comes up with, it's never anything like what I expect it to look like. It's not, you know, because they say, what do you, do you have any, um, anything you want us to put into the cover brief before we turn it over to her? So I think for this one, um, I don't remember what I said, but it wasn't anything close to that. And so she, Chelsea must just read it and say, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and then just do her own thing anyways. And thank God she does because she comes up with it amazing. I mean, my cover is truly, and I'm not bragging about that because it's, it's not my doing, it's Chelsea's doing. My covers have been amazing and I'm so grateful for that. Um, this one, um, the, if you could, Christina, can you hold it up one more time? Of course. So, thank you. So the, um, the red coat in the first version I saw of it was a lot fancier and the scarf at her neck, which is a scarf in this version was actually fur. And none of the, neither of those two things made sense for somebody living in the forest. Um, so we toned those down, roughed those up a little bit, but everything that you see right there, um, aside from that was exactly how it was. I think maybe the colors are a little bit more saturated, but it is essentially the same thing. But I will tell you that when I, everyone loved that cover, I loved that cover, but then I had to have the question, you know, because they, they give you the cover before the book's fully edited. I faced the question of why the heck is she wearing a red coat in the middle of the forest? With all that camouflage in red. <laughs> so I had to write that in and it, um, it was just a paragraph that I wrote in, but it actually does make sense because a lot of the clothing that they wore did come from um, villages and farmhouses around the forest. So I just had to insert a couple of sentences where she takes a red coat um, right. from an apartment that she's in and that winds up being what she wears in the winter for warmth. Mm -hmm. um, but that was kind of interesting to actually have to change a little something in the book to fit the cover. I, I don't know that I, I can't, that I can think of. I don't think I've had to do that before, but it was fine. It, it didn't change anything substantial, but yeah. yeah didn't you do that <laughs> with a name though, right? Wasn't it, was it room, rude, I'm oh, sorry, the room on, oh, now I'm going to screw it up. I, I know it's, it's, it's a tongue um, twister, totally. It was yeah, Amelie. Room under, so. Yeah, room under yeah. Amelie. Oh yeah. yes, I did do that with the title. You know yeah. what? The great question. Um, I did do that with the title and fantastic memory. I can't believe you remember that. Yeah, the room on Rue Amelie, I can't even remember what my working title was for it, but it was nothing good. And I never, I knew it wasn't anything good. Um, and we had a real struggle with that title. And my editor came up with the construction of the room on blah, blah, blah. But the um, the initial street I had it set on was a, a, a street that would have been very hard to pronounce, um, which didn't matter when it was in the book. And you only saw the street name a couple of times, but we couldn't have had it in the cover. So I had about a week to figure out a different street in the same neighborhood in Paris that I could set the book on without changing anything, without changing the plot, um, but that would sound nicer in the cover, in the um, in the title. And so we did, we changed it to Rue Amelie, which is a beautiful, it's a great street. It completely fits the book, but it made the title totally work. So yeah, Rue Amelie was not the original street that the action took place on. And you know, with the Forest of Vanishing Stars, our initial title was the Dove of the Dark Forest, or my initial title was, 
that they said it sounded too much like a young adult novel, like a dark young adult novel. And I'm like, I can see that point. Um, and so we had to come up with another 11th hour title and it was The Forest of Vanishing Stars. Absolutely. And I, I've i only had that happen like one time with where the cover helped kind of dictate yeah. something in the story. It's so weird, isn't yeah. it? Like, yeah, that you know. is. But which, which book was it for you? So it was The Edge of Lost. Um, which is oh, like, okay. Oh, I love that title. That's a great title. Thank you. And that's, you know, the Alcatraz story where the kids grew up mm -hmm. on Alcatraz Island, which a lot of people don't know about, you know, not just mixed yeah. with mates. Supposedly some of them did. So of course, literary gold right there. Um, yeah. And so with that cover, you know, they have like an, you know, a Irish immigrant that's on, you know, kid that's on the cover. Right. And, and I remember that came in same, same idea that came in when I was halfway through the book. Yeah. Um, and then you, and it was exactly what I wanted. I mean, it was, I literally clip art that one together and they did it exactly, but better. I mean, I went, and that was the only time I've ever done that. That's um, amazing. Which was fantastic. And then I looked at, I loved it so much that I set it up in the kitchen every day I walk by it going, I want to pet it. I just love it so much. Um, Isn't that the best? Oh, oh my gosh, it's the best feeling. I feel that way about this one. It's just, it's so beautiful. <laughs> like I, I want to go to there, right? For sure. And so, yeah. So I remember one time I thought, wait a minute. I looked, I went, I think there's a twist in the story all because of the cover. So the way that, so that is the one book oh. that if you read the beginning of the way that you see the cover in the beginning yeah. will be different the, how you view it by the end of the book. And, um, and that Ooh. only came because of the cover, which was really fun. So, well, I mean, I feel like that means that everybody watching tonight probably needs to buy the edge of lost from right? Warwick's from our wonderful independent bookseller hosting us tonight. <laughs> That seems like what they should do because you just created this mystery that we need to uncover. So they're going to read and be like, that's it. That's what I bought it for. You can blame Kristen. I didn't tell you to go buy it. Whatever. Listen, it's a, it's a paperback price. It's all right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, okay. Back to you, my dear. Um, so talk about the inspiration for this book, because that's obviously what everybody likes to hear about too, which I find fascinating. Um, when well, you know, I, I'm going to let you down because there's no good answer. Um, you know, I, I, um, I knew I wanted to um, stretch my, spread my wings a little bit, try something a little bit different. Cause I, you know, I, I've gotten very comfortable writing about World War II France and uh, my next book is about World War II France. I love writing about World War II France. I lived in Paris for a while. I visit frequently or prior to COVID I visited frequently. Um, and it's just a place that really speaks to me and a place that has a lot of really fascinating World War II history to, to uncover. Um, but I wanted to do something a little different. That had started to feel like a comfort zone. And I think you kind of have to shake it up from time to time to, to push yourself, to make yourself better, to make your writing better, to make your storytelling better. Um, and so I pushed myself east and I, you know, I wound up in Poland, uh, Eastern Poland. Um, and, um, you know, I knew vaguely the stories of the refugees, the Jewish refugees who fled into the forests, who found ways to survive, who found ways to fight back. Uh, you know, I always had found those stories um, very inspiring, very compelling. Um, but I can't tell you what led me to this story at this time. But this is something I mentioned in the author's note, too. I was... Um, I don't know, maybe three quarters, half or three quarters of the way through, through writing this book. When my little brother um, shared our ancestry.com results with me, our family tree. And, you know, I had seen it before, but I had mostly looked on my mom's side of the family before, because I was, my mom's whole side of the family is from Ireland. Um, and I was really interested in what villages they come from in Ireland and when did they come over? And, you know, it, it, everything I was really looking at the first time he sent it was on my mom's side, but he sent it again because he had filled in some new stuff. And I pulled it up and um, I looked through my dad's side of the family this time. And I knew, you know, my dad, my mom's side of the family is Irish, Irish Catholic. My dad's side of the family is three quarters Jewish. So that is where my Jewish heritage comes from. But I'd always heard that, that part of the family was from Germany, Austria, Hungary, you know, and I just kind of had vague ideas of it. Well, in looking at the ancestry.com results, that part of my family was from Poland, not that far away from this area that I was writing about that I started writing about for reasons I truly cannot explain. Um, and in looking through all that, it was like, oh, I don't know, it just touched something so deep within me to see not just that the Harmels, the people who brought the actual Harmel name over um, from Europe had come about 50 years before the war, um, had come speaking Yiddish as their primary language. And even after they had been here for decades, you could see on the census form 
they were still speaking Yiddish as their primary language. So obviously still feeling very culturally connected. Um, but that in 1933, my great, great grandmother, Rosie Harmel, actually at the age of 69, went back to Europe. And just for a visit, she returned in October of that year. But I imagine she must have gone back to visit people that she'd left behind in Poland. Um, and I think it just hit me in the gut midway through writing this book to look at that on paper and realize that in 1933, six years before World War II, World War II broke out, she was there, presumably visiting loved ones, right? And then she came home and she died in early 1941. But how must she have been feeling in the final two years of her life, the final year and a half of her life, to know what was happening to these people she'd just seen six years earlier, um, who now were honestly probably meeting an unspeakable fate? Um, so just, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know that I'm a big believer that stories live in our blood. I mean, this wasn't something I knew about. This wasn't a path that I went down because I knew I had this family history. But what other explanation is there? Then there was something a little bit beyond my grasp taking place that, that led me here at this time to tell this story. Does that make sense? I mean, I know that sounds kooky, but like, Absolutely. I don't know. I, I don't know. I was just moved, yeah. moved by that. I love that. And it makes it that much more personal for you. And I think when, did you, did you know that before you wrote the book or when you were partway through? Partway through, yeah, it was about, I was about three quarters, maybe somewhere between a half and three quarters of the way through. I guess that would be two thirds, about two thirds of the way through writing this book, is approximately. See, I can still do math. I'm still, I'm still with it, despite, time. We're despite the lack of sleep. <laughs> um, I do want to remind everyone out there um, uh, to put your questions in. Um, I want to remind you about that drawing. The only way to um, win that little prize pack is to put a question in for me or for Christina, for both of us. Um, and I also wanted to remind you out there how important it is to keep supporting independent bookstores. And it's bookstores like Warwick's putting on events like this that have connected us all through this pandemic and continue to connect us even as the world begins to get back to normal. So a great way to show your support for a store like this who's putting on events like this um, is to make a purchase. It does not have to be The Forest of Vanishing Stars. It does not have to be one of Christina's books. We hope that it is, but, um, but, it, but if you consider buying something from Warwick's tonight, that would be a great way to thank them. So just, that was my little PSA, <laughs> my little public service announcement. Absolutely. And I was actually just going to remind everybody too, I'm like, put your questions in. There's some good questions coming in too, oh, by the way. And so everybody, in, we will get to them for sure. Um, and uh, we'll circle back to those. So yes, keep going in because you could win that gorgeous bag, which I absolutely love. You know, um, I don't even have one yet. Can I enter? Am I, am I, am I barred from entering the code? Uh, can I type a question in? <laughs> I'm just sure that we can hook you up with one if you really want one. <laughs> I know people. I know people, Kristen. All right. So tell everybody. So you talked a bit about like your personal connection with this book, yeah. which is so, so amazing. What keeps drawing you back to World War II? Because I know obviously I, I've written several books in yeah. World War II. Thinking like you, I'm going to spread my wings. I'm yeah. not a World War II author. And then I went all the way to 1930s. You know, like that was, that was my big move, people. Um, so what about you? What keeps drawing you back over and over again? Um, you know, I will answer that, but then I would like to hear your answer to that question too, because I'm, I'm really curious what you have to say. Um, so for me, it's, it's a lot of things. I mean, there were a number of reasons why I got into writing wo about World War II in the first place. Um, but I think the reason that I've stayed with writing World War II is that there are so many stories still to tell, so many fascinating stories that shouldn't have been lost. Or some of them aren't lost, but they're not they're not things we immediately remember. They're not things that everybody knows. Um, and, and they are not just stories that um, can inspire us from, you know, remembering what people did 80 years ago. They're stories that are relevant today. There's so much relevance, I think, to writing about World War II. Um, it's a past that's not that distant. It's a past I think we all have um, a fairly recent family connection to. I mean, my my grandparents were all adults during World War II. Uh, my two grandfathers um, served in the, right, one, one of them was in the Navy, the other one was in the Merchant Marines. Um, you know, I, I think we all, it, it's, it doesn't feel that far away because we have that connection. We still have survivors of that war with us. We still have people who fought in that war with us. Um, although we're getting very close to the time when we're gonna lose them. Um, but you know, 
I think one, there's a couple things to me in particular that really resonate about World War II. It's, for one thing, I, I, I kind of like to say that in a way, it's like what draws us to superhero movies, right? Because in superhero movies or, or comics or whatever, we know there's a good guy, we know there's the bad guy, and it's what happens in between that's interesting. And you know, I mean, you know who you're rooting for, but like, how is the story gonna unfold? And I feel like it's that with World War II. Like the stakes are there, you know what's at stake. You know who's on the side of good, you know who's in theory on the side of bad, right? But it's what you do in that gray area. So it, it's, a, it's a comfortable world we can all sink our teeth into, but there's so much room to maneuver and tell stories in that world. Um, the other thing is, I think that it's a dark period in our modern history. And I think that all of us go through periods of darkness and difficult times in our lives. Um, we went through one as a world through COVID that, you know, that over the last year and a half, that's not entirely over. Um, and I think it's helpful to be reminded, whether it's COVID or whether it's just something personal you're going through, that in every patch of darkness, you can find the light, you can find the light within you, you can find a way to move forward, you can find a way to survive, and you can find a way to thrive and help other people to move through that darkness too. And I think that's something that a lot of World War II stories remind us of, um, that isn't going to go away and that isn't going to stop being relevant. Um, and I, I feel honored to continue sharing these stories and, and reminding us of that essential human truth. How about you, Christina? What, what makes you continue uh, coming back to World War II stories? That's why I just go, just what she said. Oh. <laughs> um, no, yeah, no, absolutely. I, the thing that I love about World War II, yeah, that's so, I don't know that we talked about with our grandpas. My, my grandpa's same thing was um, who his, you know, courtship letters with my grandma, of course, um, as you well know, inspired my debut novel, Letters from Home. Um, and so for me, yeah, that's how it became, it started being very personal. And he, but he was in the Navy, same, same. Oh my gosh. Grandfather, so. Wouldn't it be crazy? I mean, no chance, right? But hey, maybe they knew each other. Maybe they were buddies in the Navy. You and I both know that it, life is stranger than fiction. How many times have we right. both brought research nuggets that you think, my gosh, it has to go in the book and you actually can't do it because yes. people would say, oh, that would never that happen. That didn't happen. Exactly. Yeah. It's so yeah. true. You're totally right. right. Yes. Read the, you know, you try to you know, find a, a lost loved one and you find out that, right, that they were, um, that they were living in the next town, like for the last yes. few years. I mean, stuff that people don't believe you're totally yeah. right. Yes. It totally happens. Um, so yeah, so you never know. Um, so yeah, my grandfather was a uh, Navy signalman on a destroyer escort. So, you know, the whole thing was, he would joke about like, A, B, C, D, E, you know, he's like, did you get that? You know, like really oh, fast. That's cute. That's funny. It was very fun. Was, um, that, was that the grandpa with the, the, didn't he have tattoos? Was that that same, the same grandpa? Yep. The, the one tattoo. Yes. Which, you know, that story, which is the, <laughs> you know, that he had the, the sailor girl right on his forearm <laughs> at 17 years old when he joined the Navy that he woke up and had the bandage on his arm and didn't know what was under it. Let's just soak in that. Let's just soak in that panic for one second here. <laughs> I love and, it. Yeah. And you peel it back and go, she's clothed. Okay. She's clothed. <laughs> That's good. I, I, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so everything's gonna be okay. Um, yeah, but he, as you well know, he move his knuckles and make her wiggle and dance. I remember, that's amazing. Or shimmy, you know, you can't make this stuff up. Uh, which again, all goes in the book, people. You will, you are all fodder if we know you. <laughs> so, it's so true. Nobody's be careful. Be careful what you say. <laughs> um, yeah. So for me, with World War II specifically, but everything about history, but um, specifically World War II, is that coming across a nugget of history that you think, how did I not know this? By now yes. you think we've heard all the World yes. War II stories. And because it was such, right, a conflict on such a global yes. scale that we had yeah. never seen before, um, you know, bigger than World War One, And, you know, yes. it's just um, having stakes higher than, yes. I think that's the thing with the books too, right? Is that how, how do you surpass the stakes of a yes. World War II novel, right? And on a personal level, on a global level, I, just on a, on a humanitarian level, and so I think that's what, you know, draws me to it. Plus, uh, please, the romanticism of the era. I mean, because we didn't live it, especially, oh, right? It's the music and the right. fashion and the, oh, it's just, it's just beautiful. The reunions and it's, there's a lot of um, beauty that came through that darkness. And um, as we know, and the strength and resilience that people had that, that you just go, they just don't make them like that anymore. You know, um, 
totally people. right. Yes, absolutely. When I think of the, gener- the greatest generation, they really truly are. I don't know that we'll ever see a generation like that again. Um, yeah. Just in that, right, where we're like, boo-hoo, you know, not that this past year wasn't hard for a lot of people in so many ways, goodness yeah. gracious. Um, but at first, you know, like, ooh, boo-hoo, we have to sit on our couch and watch Netflix, you know, it's kind of the joke. And and compared to our grandparents, it's just, you yes. know, rationing yes, everything. Sat- and you know? so and- much sacrifice. Even here in the United States, which, you know, was less impacted in general by the war than Europe, right? So you're, yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, oh, I was going to ask something. Else. Or You know what else about World War II um, that I think makes it still worth telling these stories is I think that if you go back 10 or 15 years, right? If somebody had said, what stories do you know about World War II? What you would have responded with or what most people would respond with were something about a battle. They would have talked about D-Day. Um, they would have talked about Pearl Harbor. They would have talked about something that had to do with the military in World War II. But I think one of the things that we're uncovering um, and bringing to the forefront more is that women were so involved behind the scenes. And right. not just women, but but just regular average Joe citizens who were not in the military, but who played an enormous role and probably um, were instrumental, I think, in 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 the winning of the war. I think if there were not all these people working for the underground, working for the resistance, um, sabotaging German supply lines, things like that, um, the, the war might might have gone the other way, right? So, um, so I think we're at a point in time where we're viewing history through a different prism. And I think that's, um, I think that's really special. I, I think that's, that's an awesome way to look at something we thought we knew and view it slightly differently, which makes me think um, that we should be looking at everything in our lives a little bit more closely because it's sometimes easy to, to just view things through the prism that we're given. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, even I remember I, I knew of the movie before the book, which is Hidden Figures, right? When I remember watching yes, this. Yes, yeah. How did we not know this? How did we not know this? And thank goodness that book was written, right? Like, and thank goodness the movie was made because now we know and it rewrites our entire understanding of what went on there. And I think when you understand something like that, something as momentous as that, from a different perspective, it makes you understand yourself from a different perspective and your own ability to do things and affect change and, and you know change the world. So um, yes, I think that's so important. But you know, um, while we're talking about um, true stories and you know it, it, the impact of that and things like hidden figures. Um, you and I both come from a journalism background in different ways or a, a, a background where um, you know, we ask people questions and report the true, you know, true absolute truth, right? How do you think that influences the books we write and the way we write them? So hang on one second. I'm so sorry. Sweetie. You kind of cut out for just one second. Oh, it, it might have been mine. I'm, I'm in the, I'm on the, um, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I'm um, like, I, mouth moving. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. Um, no, you know what? It's probably, I, I, I have the, I'm in this hotel room and I did pay for the nice internet. <laughs> like maybe it's not, I'm asking for my $7 back. Um, <laughs> so just, just last part one more time. I'm so sorry. Um, so you and I both come from kind of a background in journalism. How do you think that influences the books we write and the way we write them? Absolutely. I think, um, well, you and I both then look for the story, right? I mean, I think that journalism yeah. is storytelling. So, yes, um, yeah. and, and we are trying to find those nuggets, right? That haven't, that haven't hopefully been told before or told in a new way. Absolutely. So to make it fresh, even if you yeah. read the same thing over and over. Um, and I think so much of the research, right? And the, the yeah. interviewing people and um, the curiosity, the questions, we're constantly asking yeah. the questions that lead to the next thing, to the next thing. That's and, exactly it. Yep. Yeah very much in common. I I can't imagine a historical author who doesn't have curiosity (laughs) as they're driving, as they're driving, um, which I think is journalism. I mean, the best journalists are curious and um, and always looking for the answers. So yeah. So what about you? Is that, is that how you think they're tied? Yeah, yeah, I I, I think so. Yes, I think so. Um, I think that coming from a journalism background, I think it gives us the tools to do the research we need to do. I think, I think that if you don't come from a journalism background, you can learn how to do that. But I think maybe we started with a little bit of an advantage. Um, I feel like coming from a journalism writing background, because I primarily wrote for magazines, it helped me with dialogue. That was something. Um, But I also, yeah, storytelling is a good point and digging deep and asking questions. I think being able to ask people the deep questions, because when we're lucky enough to speak to someone who's actually experienced um, something that we're writing about, 
it's, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know if you feel this way too, but I, you know, if I had not been a journalist or if I had been a little bit earlier in my career, I would have felt like, oh, I don't want to ask that. I don't know if that's polite to ask or, and, but like as a journalist, you kind of just get used to digging deep and going deep and to have the ability to do that. And then to turn the heart of that into a book, I think, um, I think is really, really cool and, and really, really a neat use of our, our journalism backgrounds. Um, you know, I'm also curious, Christina, um, if you're anything like me, and um, I know that you are, um, you probably wind up with a huge mountain of facts that you've gleaned from your research. Um, but you can't put all those facts into a book because then it would just feel like an info dump, right? And it would feel like somebody was reading like a, just a dry um, collection of details. You can't do like a bulleted list of like, here are the things I learned and do I get five stars, right? Do I get a gold star? Um, so how do you actually balance what you know and what you've learned with what you've put into the book without doing that dreaded info dump? How do you, how do you balance that? I'd love to hear what you think on that too. Um, so for me, I research heavily right before and then research as I go along, right? So yep. there, there's the same. so many, right? Nuggets you come across, you go, oh my gosh, that's so cool. It has to go in there somewhere, if possible. If it doesn't slow the story down, you know? Um, yes. yep. And even better, if it serves the story, then then all the better, um, which is always the hope, of course. And it's amazing to me, actually, this is kind of a side note, but it's amazing to me because I, I, as you know, I just finished my latest book a couple yes. days ago. So I'm a little bit in a blur, um, <laughs> a little bit in days, but um, what's amazing to me is how often I came across an, a little tidbit that I think, oh my gosh, this is, you can't make this stuff up. That's, I mean, in my yes. new story, there's also Houdini um, is involved, even though it's not his time period. Um, and so researching him and, and then some, and then at the end of the book, you realize you come across this stuff and think, not only did it, did it, was it fascinating to put in, it actually became very important to the story. Yes. And it's kind of crazy how you plant the seeds, not really knowing that they're going to be important. Yes especially with factual information, right? And then just because it, you have to put it in somewhere, even though we're not really supposed to do that, but we do. Yeah, yeah. And then you, and later you go, oh my gosh, I can't imagine the book without it. It, it, it kind of became altering to the story because 100%. of it. 100%, so, yes. So kind of a little side note on that. But other than that, as far as sifting through, um, you know, there, yeah, I think that I highlight like crazy. I mean, right, we're always writing like a, a yeah. thesis right? <laughs> that never ends. Um, and so yeah. highlighting, and then I will dictate it all into my phone. This, that's my new mm. thing this time. Dictate it in my phone, it's faster than typing. And then oh. it, goes right, it goes right to my computer um, because it's all Mac. And so then I'm able to put it all into Word docs and, um, and oh, dump that's them in. awesome. Did I just teach you something new? It's so fun. No. That, that's, you know what? I didn't, I did not think of doing that for research. Susan Meisner has talked about how she does that for her actual writing. She writes by dictating it into her phone. Um, I, now you've given me a new use of my phone, a new tool. Okay. Oh my gosh, completely. Yeah. I just do all there. It's fantastic. It goes so much faster. Awesome. And then from there, of course, you know, printing out, printing out. I mean, I have so many stacks, right? Of all these yeah. pages, they're all stapled and, and then highlighted and then, reading it all. And what I do is I go back and I don't know about you, but I reread all the highlights then yeah. that are the most important. And I don't figure out exactly where they're going to go in. Um, it's, you yeah. know, not that methodical as much as it kind of let it just sort of um, percolate and let it just yeah. absorb and find that very often I'll go back and go, oh, I included that. Oh, I included that. Yeah. Um, and then I left all these things that I go, oh, it's good that I left them out because th that yeah. it wasn't necessary. So yep. I just let it incubate, I guess is probably the best word. Have you ever found though that something you come across um, sends your plot spinning in a different direction? I mean, like what, like once you already have the framework of the plot down and you kind of know what the book's going to be about, have you ever come across something that, that you put in, that you have to put in and everything shifts enough to change the course of the book? I don't think I've had it changed the course of the book as much as it's become longer. <laughs> <laughs> Book. Book. more chapters you know as you well know like this is my longest book ever and I did not in I didn't I never intended that I thought this was going to be my goal was to make it my shortest book <laughs> that's hilarious and here Editor. we are yeah it was 
the, that was my goal. I like, I knew how many pages I wanted it to be. It was going to be short. And that, that, that blew up on me, but it's because I come across things. I go, Oh, this has got to go in. Yeah. And it made the, it, I think the story so interesting and it, but it, was, it made little side trails on the, on the, you know, um, uh, on the, the path of the, of the character. So, um, and as far as you go too, I, I don't think I've asked you that before. How much are you a, um, plotter or, you know, or like, as we call it, is it, a, a, I, I always call it like a panster, but then the I don't know if it's panster or pantser. I never know where to that, and then I never say it because I'm like, I don't know what I'm, I don't know if I'm saying I realize right I've been wrong for years. I'm so sorry. I'm like, I think I just got from other people panster, and I'm like, oh, it's panster, of course. Like we write by the seat of our pants, so that I've that, said panster too. I, I don't know e either one. Um, <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah, how um, do you I am a big plotter. I'm a huge plotter. Are you? Are you or no? You? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah so it, it gives me it gives me anxiety when historical fiction writers in particular are like oh no I just sit down and write I'm like but how like you're writing about stuff that really happened in history like you have to hit certain dates and like leave facts in I'm like that's amazing I wish I could do that yes oh my gosh yes okay I do want to move on and take questions because it yeah. sounds like we have a lot but, but before we do that can you just give us a quick idea of what your next book is about anything you're comfortable sharing I'm I'm just so excited for it Oh my gosh. I, and I've been talking to you since before, I think before I started writing, I think maybe, or at least in the I very think. beginning. Yeah. When we I remember talking about, yeah, I remember talking about it, but I can't, I don't think, you, I can't remember if you started yet or not. Yeah. So, okay. So um, what I can share right now so far is that, um, oh, I'm so excited to share a whole lot more. Finally, um, World War II, it's, um, it is, what I can tell you is it's called The Ways We Hide. It's due out so far, um, unless something crazy happens, not that we don't know what that's like anymore. Um, so we're not gonna count on anything. Um, it's supposed to be next August. Uh, so it'll be a September book. Uh, and it is, uh, I can tell you what it's inspired by, the fact that there was a secret British military intelligence group that I had never heard of during World War II. And right by now we think, oh, we've heard about this thing. No, of course not. And I know. And as you know, I saw Susan Meisner, who we both adore, is on the call right now. And so Susan knows um, when I, you know, when I talk to people like Susan, who knows everything about history, and, um, and she does. Oh my gosh, she does. And Kate Quinn, you know, who of course wrote the Alice Network and Rose Code, and yeah. who knows all about everything. The world. Yes. When you ask them, and they say, "I've never heard of that before," you think, "Okay, I'm onto something yeah. here." Um, and what I can tell you is they were a very specialized group. They um, recruited very unusual people um, and they used things that you have all, you all have in your homes. You've all grown up with them. You have no idea they used them the way they did. And they were so successful at some of these that they kept them classified until 1985 because they thought they might have to use them in the Cold War against the Russians. That's amazing. So how about that? Like that in itself, that, and that is one part of the story. <laughs> But that that is what kicked off the whole book. And um, and I thought, oh my gosh, once again, if I haven't heard of this, I think a lot of people haven't heard of this either. Yeah. So that it's it and for me, it's like a movie in my head. So within 15 minutes, once I put two stories together and realized a backstory belonged together, um, I knew within 15 minutes I had probably, you know, a, a good half of the story in my mind in about 15 minutes. So um, so, but then it's just taking me like two years to put it on paper. <laughs> so. but, but that just means it's going to be beautiful and wonderful and sweeping. It's going to be absolutely oh. incredible. I can't wait. I cannot wait to read it. Oh, absolutely. Hurry up, hurry up with those edits so you can get it to me. <laughs> my, my friends are like, oh, this is going to be good. I go, gosh, I hope so. <laughs> For all of this, I'd really be really disappointed if it's bad. Um, okay. So. Yeah. Let's ask you some questions here. Um, okay, so love the red coat, Maria says. Where can I buy that coat? <laughs> I don't know, but Maria, if you figure it out, let me know too, because there may be like two days a year in Florida where I could wear a coat like that, and I would wear it. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, I do want that coat. Okay, here we go. So from Danielle. Hi, from South Florida. The book is amazing. Yes, it is. And by the way, I didn't get to gush yet. I realized we jumped into <laughs> our story so quickly as I told you the minute I got yours like I text you and I even have a picture of me reading the book while I'm giving blood <laughs> oh. that's how much it so the, down. Okay. Forest, the forest of vanishing stars it will make you bleed is that the is that the... You, bleed. you won't want to stop bleeding while you read this book um that's the red you know so it worked out great um people when you open this book 
it, from, and I, you know, I, I always love your books, but I, I told you, I text you, I'm like, this is your best book yet. This is, I mean, every book is good. Um, and, but the writing that it grabs you from page one, you just, you don't want to put it down. It's such a page turner. So people, oh my gosh, get, get the book from Orwicks. Um, okay. So question for you is from Danielle. Um, my question for you is what was your inspiration for um, Alicander's is that Alexander's? Is that right? Uh, um, Alexander. Alexander. Yep. Okay. I'm like, wait a minute. Did I misremember? Yeah, okay. Yeah, good, good. Good. That's the title. Alex, I'm like, oh shoot, did I forget? Okay, Alexander's character. What was the motivation for Alexander's or the inspiration? Oh, um. That is a great question. Um, you know. I would say, okay, so Alexander is somebody who Yona encounters relatively early in the book. He's a young man um, leading a group of refugees um, who has pro he's promised to protect them. And um, he is realizing that he's a little bit out of his depth as winter approaches. Um, I will tell you that if I fled into the woods, I would be enormously out of my depth. And I, you know, and I think a lot of these people were, I think a lot of these people had no choice but to go into the woods. Um, because it was the only way to live, but most of them had been, had had professional jobs in the villages um, or in, in the, um, or in the towns around the forest. Um, most of them didn't have the forest survival skills. They just knew that there was no other choice. And so I think that's kind of at the heart of Alexander. He knows a little bit and he knows enough to have gotten the group of people he's leading by, but um, but it's getting harder and winter is approaching. And, um, and I think that in the not knowing how to do what he needs to do, um, especially as winter begins to advance, begins to arrive, um, he's filled with insecurity. And I think that um, to me, one of the things that um, resonated to me in the writing of this novel uh, and in the research of it, and just in talking to people, is that regardless of what situation we find ourselves in in life, um, whether it's being refugees in a forest, whether it's, you know, having to shelter at home during COVID, whatever it is, you get past the hard stuff and then humans are humans. You know what I mean? We, we love, we hate, we betray, we lie, we help, we hurt, we, you know, all of the human things that we do still go on, even if you're fighting for your survival. And I think that Alexander is um, the very embodiment of that. And some of the things Alexander does in the novel with, without giving any spoilers um, are things that were very common in um, the survivor groups, which might be surprising. You, or you, you, know, you would think that everyone would be focused only on their survival. Um, but I think that that just urge to act like a human being with all with all your flaws, you know, kicks in eventually, and you just go back to being you, if that makes sense. So I hope that was a good answer. I'm, I'm not really sure how to say what the inspiration was, but um, but that's kind of at the core of who Alexander is. Yeah, and I will tell you that through this book too. And my husband loves the show Naked and Afraid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and strange of a show as it is, oh god, this light is just coming through the window. Sorry about that. Very okay, angelic. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah for those of you who have not seen it um it is such a strange I remember just going this is so strange but then you get sucked in because you're like this is people are amazing what they yeah. can do as far as their survival skills and yeah. and how they can make something out of nothing and um so I, I remember thinking that through your book you know except thankfully they were not naked so that's good they were not naked they were clothed most of the time <laughs> Um, okay, so here we go. So Sue has a question. Um, what gave you the idea to start with a kidnapping? Yeah, I, I think a lot of people probably wonder that, right? That is such a great question, but I don't, again, I keep telling you, I don't have good answers for these things. Um, that part just came to me. That part came to me whole. Um, once I knew who Yona had to be to kind of propel this story forward, um, the story of that kidnapping was just in my head, complete. I mean, I could see, I could see Yerusha, the old woman, 
shimmying up the the um, or climbing up the fire escape. I could see her, her shimmy shimmying down the iron rail, clutching this baby like against her. Um, you know, I I could see her spying on the Utners, the the parents. Um, I could see the Utners um, and other Germans passing her and ignoring her because she's 82 when the book begins, and they think. Well, she'll be dead soon. She's not, you know, she's not worth even observing. She's not worth even nodding at. And meanwhile, she's here trying to steal their child um, and they don't even acknowledge her. Um, so yeah, that part just kind of came to me whole, but it seems like, um, I don't know, it just, I think part of it is that I'm on this quest for my own identity that is kind of sparked by finding out these little different pieces about my past. And so maybe that was a, a portion of it. What happens when you grow up not knowing who you biologically are and, and you know, where you've come from and what role that heritage plays in, in who, you, um, who you are today in the world. Um, and, and that's a little bit of the journey that I'm on. So I've never been kidnapped, but um, you know, maybe part of that was a little personal, just, just making her a total fish out of water with no, um, no real starting point for her background. Absolutely. And so I have another question here, but go ahead and people just reminder, since we have about 10 minutes left, that if you do have a question, even if I don't get to it, if you put it in, you were entered in the contest. So that's right. Exactly. And Christina, are there any that, that go to you also? Because I'd love to hear you answer a question. I don't have them in front of me. Let me see. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. Although let me ask you this, because I, I know this one. So Jennifer wants to know, do you speak fluent French? I know you lived in Paris. Um, I do not speak fluent French. Um, and... For this book, um, I don't even think there is any French in this book. This is, um, but no, I don't speak fluent French. I wish I did. I lived in Paris. I, you know, my um, my minor in college was Spanish, and there was a point in time that I spoke Spanish fluently, which uh, which I've kind of lost over the years. But um, I, that lets me read French because the written languages are very similar. But I think it really confused me. I did try to learn French after having lived in Paris. I came back and took a couple of years worth of classes at the Alliance Francaise, um, the, the, Francaise, the, um, the uh, organization that's in a lot of cities that teaches French classes and um, promotes French culture. Um, and it was very, very difficult for me to learn because everything looked like Spanish because they have a lot of similar word roots, but everything was conjugated differently and pronounced differently. And I think that trying to learn French made my Spanish worse. <laughs> sense so I tried to acquire a third language and lost my second language I completely understand I don't know if you know I was I was a um, language concentration in college I did not know that yeah, so I I love languages I find them fascinating I, I did Japanese awesome. and Italian and um and Spanish and Italian as you well know then those are so similar that the good news is what it's one is really easy I studied Spanish for quite a while before I learned Italian and it was very easy to learn but yeah. then you can very easily if you're out of practice mix, mix them, them up, up. And yeah. Spanish and Italian, I think, are a lot more similar spoke in terms of um, pronunciation yes. than um, than Spanish and French are. So the word roots are all the same because they're all of those Romance languages. But I actually had an easy time, not easy, but I could make myself understood in Italy, mostly fumbling my way through Spanish, you know. Um, but I, I, you know, I will say that um, that I work with a lot of translators to translate um uh, the foreign words that I use in my books, the words from other languages. And Christina, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but my little brother is huge into languages. He speaks like, oh. I don't know, like seven languages fluently. Um, no way. And yeah, and um, so much so that his job is working for Univision, the Spanish language um, network um, in their ratings department, but he uses uh, Spanish all, all day long in his job. And he's, you know, that's a second language for him. So yeah, which is cool. Yeah. Okay. All right, so here's a question that and I, I think I know the answer to this one, but okay. but I do want you to get into it. And that is, Jane wants to know, did you travel to Poland to research for the book? Given I, that you wrote this in 2020. <laughs> yeah, so, so here's what not to do. Do not um, come up with an idea for a book set in Poland in January of 2020. Great. Sell it to your publisher in, 20, in February of 2020 and begin writing it in March of 2020. Because guess what happens? You don't get to go anywhere. Yeah. Um, no, I, um, I I wish I had been able to go. My plan obviously was to go, um, but I was able to find a man named Vadim Sidorovich who had written a guide to the Malabaki forest, which is the forest at the heart of this novel. Um, and I, I shouldn't say a guide, it's an academic, um, an academic text. And it's 
a full, thick text about the flora, fauna, and human history of the forest. Um, so that became one of my primary resources right out of the gate. But, you know, and I, it's all marked up with, you know, post-it notes and highlights and underlines and all of that. But there were still things I couldn't find, and there were really specific things I needed to know. And so I reached out to him and told him what I was doing, and he said he would help. And we wound up working out an arrangement where I paid him by the hour, and I would send him like 20 questions at a time. Okay. And they would be things like, um, and I, you know, if you've been to one of my virtual events before, you've heard me share the same example, but um, it would be things like, I would say it's April and it's just started to rain. They haven't built their shelter for the night yet. They're in this part of the forest. What would they do? And he would send back, well, they would find a hollowed out oak tree because in that area of the forest, there were these old hollowed out oaks that were hundreds of years old. And, um, you know, they had room inside for three men. And just so you can visualize it, I've trekked into that part of the forest. And here's a picture of me standing inside the hollowed oak tree. And oh you God. can see that it would fit two other men inside. So like, but that it would be 20 doses of that at a time, like multiple, multiple times, like uh, twice a week, three times a week. And so, so many of the details in the novel, so much of the color that brought it alive was from him, from, was from these questions that, um, he went not only the extra mile, but like the extra, I don't even know, like the extra hundred miles to answer. It was amazing. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the questions, of course, um, is, well, actually, we'll do this last because it's kind of the what's next. So we we will, that's a good way to wrap it up. Um, okay. Let's see, how about, we already know kind of that you already know, how, how long does it usually take for you to write a book? Is it about a year? Yeah, my whole process is about a year from idea, research, everything. Yeah, I, I'm, on, I'm on a book a year. So yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. And then, and in between taking care of little ones and stepping on Legos. So, um, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so that one, and then, um, you know, Mary Lee wanted to know um, if you knew the end of your stories. Um, and specifically this one, did you know the ending when you started? And sorry, I'm like, you notice people, I'm like gradually moving back, trying to get out of that sun. Do you notice this? Like, okay. I, funny, tried to smooth, settle, smooth. But I like it. I like it. That was a nice subtle Okay. Um, yeah, it, this, this one, I did know the end to, um, by the time, you know, I, I know the end to all of them by the time I start writing, right. I don't always know the end when I start outlining, but I, because I outline so extensively, um, I always know the ending, um, by the time I, I start writing, um, chapter one. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. How about and you? Do, do you always know your end? Do you know where you're going? Most of the time? Yes. But then, you know, obviously you and I'm sure both, right. There's always surprises. Um, yeah. it's fuller than I, you know, kind of yeah. expect than the real people and, um, that they feel like, um, we always say, right. We're either writers or we need therapy <laughs> because, yes, right? you know, because we have voices in our heads. Um, and That's they feel, normal. and I write them in <laughs> I meet with book clubs and they're, they talk about an old book that, you know, an older book that I've written. And I think, I go, oh, I forgot about him. Oh, I love him. You know, and I think, Me too. Oh, isn't that funny? Like person. But isn't that funny when a book club wants you to do an older book and you show up like, of course I wrote that book. Of course I'll be able to talk about it. And then they ask about a storyline that you're like, was that in my book? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I write that. That. Oh, okay, that, yeah. Um, no, but really, like when I think of characters, I go, oh, I love, and they, they feel like old friends. I go, oh, I forgot about him. Oh, I'd love yeah. him. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> we, are, we are weird people, man. Um, okay, are, so <laughs> but that's why we're friends. It's it's the yeah, weirdness. We are. Somebody <laughs> speaking of which, someone asked how we got to meet in the first place. So um <laughs> like how did, weird. I think they think they're like, how did you two get put together is really more the question. But um, so yeah, how did we meet on the first place? Was it because uh, of San Diego? It, was it because of what? San Diego because of it events? was because of San Diego. So I, I have to tell this. Um, so we were doing, and then we should probably wrap up because yeah. only because I have been up since six <laughs> on the road since seven thirty and have not had a break and have not had anything to eat really right. since um, breakfast except for a couple of crackers and some asparagus. Um, because, <laughs> okay. because well, the, okay. So the luncheon I did today, um, the food looked delicious, but it was a spinach quiche. What happens when you eat a spinach quiche right before you I speak? So I looked at that spinach quiche and I was like, you are not going to do me any favors. Um, and so, yes, I'm bone tired and starving. And there's a plate of hummus behind me that I'm so excited about. But um, you and I met, 
because we were doing um, an Adventures by the Book uh, event uh, on the Queen Mary with um, Susan McBath, which was fun. But prior to that, we were doing something that Susan and I think Kathy Bennett had um, worked together to organize in San Diego. Um, I think actually that was also an Adventures by the Book. Yep. Um, and it was going to be you and I and Christy Woodson Harvey and Mary Alice Monroe doing a luncheon together. And they had met you before. I had not. Um, and you were the kindest person in the universe because you emailed me and said, would you like to stay with me? And I was like, oh, I don't know her. This feels awkward. And I think I wrote back and said something like, oh, you don't have to do that. Like, that's okay. That's so sweet. Like, I'm so happy to meet you at the lunch and I'm so excited to look, you know, looking forward to it. And you were like, okay, but they're all staying with me and we're just going to have a fun girl sleepover and you should come too. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, I'm, I, I, you might've mentioned wine. I, I always show up for wine. <laughs> you know, there was steam room, there was singing, there we were Mary Alice and the Christie's. So there, there, there's a lot of things that happened down there. Yeah, yeah the it was, it was amazing, but that was all because of your kindness. If you had not extended that kind offer, I'm not sure that, um, that you and I would know each other. We, we would know each other, but we wouldn't know each other like we know each other. So thank you for that. Thank you for being kind. And it, only because I know Julie's here. She's like, she's keeping us on track. Thank goodness for Julie. Um, so well, otherwise she's like, oh goodness, these girls are going to talk all night. Um, That's okay too. So uh, before we go, last question, right? That I promised at the end that everybody wants to know is what, are you able to talk about what you're doing next? What's going to be sold? Yeah, um, like well, it's due, it's due in November and I'm not nearly as far along on it as I should be. Um, but um, I will say that it is World War II France. Again, I've returned to World War II France. The working title is The Paris Daughter. I'm not sure that that's going to stick. It might be The French Daughter. It might be something like that. Um, but it is about two mothers, two daughters, a bomb that drops where it shouldn't, a family blown apart, like destroyed. Not That's a bad imagery. Not blown apart by the bomb, but like blown apart by circumstance. Um, and then a storyline that takes place in 1960 New York. So... Oh. Um, Yes, and some of the pieces come together. So that's all I can say now, not because I am being coy and evasive, but because- That's all that's written. <laughs> that's all that's written. <laughs> I'll tell you when I figure out more. <laughs> <laughs> you might not know, do you know the end of this one yet? <laughs> yes, I do, but that's about all I know. I know the beginning and I know the end. It's the middle, middle part. part. <laughs> How we get there, you'll get there. <laughs> well, We'll travel that road. All right, everybody. Great questions coming in. They were coming fast and furious. Um, we, I'm sorry we didn't get to even a fraction of them, um, but great questions, everybody. So, but I think a lot of them were answered in the discussion that you oh, had. Good. So I okay. think that most people got um, what they, but the most exciting part is let's give that bag away. Yes. So I attached everybody, just so you know, I attached a number to your question, to your names. So I know a bunch of you were um, asking a bunch of questions, but you got your number in once so it was for your name. So I was keeping track of that. Um, so we, let's have Kristen pick a number between one and 29. Ooh, 14. 14. We have Danielle Lee is oh, our Danielle winner. Lee. Congratulations. Oh, you did good. Yeah, there you go. So Danielle Lee. So Danielle, hopefully you sir, are still on here with us. Because what I need you to do is I need you to private message or message Warwick's um, in here so I can get an email address from you so that I can send that to Michelle, to Kristen's publicist, who will send you that wonderful bag. So, and if she's not, I think there's a way that I can go back on the comments and um, let her know that she won. So um, I always end these fun things. Oh, there she is. She's on there. Hi, Danielle. So she's saying, oh my God. Oh, awesome. Congratulations, Danielle. <laughs> Yay. Um, so Christina, you have a wonderful website to direct people to that they can find like all your other social channels. Is that correct? Yes, yes, yes. So it's just my name, ChristinaMcMorris.com. Yep. Perfect. Okay. And then Kristen, how about you? Similarly, KristenHermel.com. <laughs> there you go. Easy. You guys are easy. So um, go to Warwicks.com to find out more events that are happening. Order books from, if not us, your local independents. We always appreciate that. It's how we are able to continue to do these wonderful things for you. Um, Kristen, go eat the hummus. Oh, go to go, sleep. Go to sleep. <laughs> 
So I'm going to tell you, as soon as we end this, it's, we're going to go away. So thank you and good night to everybody. Thank so. you so much. Bye. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Julie. And thank you so much to everybody out there for tuning in. I appreciate it. Bye. Oh, and Friends in Fiction. We should probably just really quickly tell people about Friends yeah, in Fiction. If, oh, that's so true. If you're not with us already, um, Friends in Fiction, uh, it is a group that actually Christina was part of at the very beginning. And then, oh, you didn't have time. And we miss you every day. Everyone says to say hi to you. I told them while we were coming, I was coming here today. But um, it's with Mary Kay Andrews, Mary Alice Monroe, Patty Callahan Henry, Christy, Wood Christy Woodson Harvey. Um, it is a Facebook group. We also have a YouTube channel. We do a Wednesday night Facebook live show at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific every Wednesday. Tonight we have Paula McLean. Um, oh, fun. I think we have Vanessa Riley next week, I believe. Um, and then Christina Baker Klein, I think the week after. Um, we've had Susan Meisner, who I believe was here tonight. We've had Christina. We will have Christina again. So um, fun. It's a lot of fun. If you love books, if you love reading, um, it's a fun place to be. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on YouTube. And we always support independent bookstores because it's so important to us. Excellent. Well, thank you. It's always a treat seeing both of you. Um, hopefully we'll see each other one day in person. Yes. yes. Someday soon. <laughs> Love it. Right. So good, good night, everybody. Bye. Thank you so much. Good night. Thanks a lot.